Hello and welcome back to Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm a climate corruption journalist and your host. Every week, I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are scientists, politicians, academics, journalists, and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic, ecological, and political crises that we face today, revealing what's really going on and what they think needs to be done. This is a critical time for our planet. It demands critical thinking. Click the subscribe button now and go to planetcritical.com to learn more. My guest this week is Matt Leininger, Head of Democracy Innovation at the National Conference of Citizenship. Matt's been one of the central figures in democratic innovation over the last 20 years. He worked on President Obama's mental health campaign. He's written a range of books about new forms of democracies. He's worked with Everyday Democracy, the National League of Cities. He served in the Deliberative Democracy Consortium. Essentially, Matt has devoted 20 years of his life to figuring out how democracy can be done better. And I think uh, one of my favorite things that he says in this episode is that everybody talks about saving democracy. And really, we should be talking about improving it. Matt gives a range of models of democratic innovation that are currently being used in cities and in nations around the world. He explains how we mustn't be fearful of tech. We can use tech and we should use tech to facilitate democratic innovation in order to improve civic engagement and in order to create more active, engaged and happier citizens. He speaks about the fact that we are currently running our democracies with institutions that were created in the 20th century when we have 21st century citizens and problems and the mismatch is causing a lot of tension and the problems that we see in today's world. He names a whole bunch of resources and paths that citizens can follow if they want to improve the democratic process where they live. And he gives a really well-rounded analysis of why elected officials seem to just sort of be doing the wrong thing very frequently, whether it's at the local level or the international level. This is a really informative episode and I hope you all enjoy it. If you do, please share it far and wide. And if you're loving the show, support Planet Critical with a paid subscription at planetcritical.com or on Patreon. The link is in the description box below. And a huge thank you to the Planet Critical community who keep this project going every week. Matt, thank you very much for joining me on Planet Critical. It's a real pleasure and an honor to have you on the show, given all of your work in democracy innovation over the past 20 years. Thank you. Great. Thank you for inviting me. Great to be here with you. Thank you very much. So could you um, give some background about your career and how you got in, I think specifically how you got into democracy innovation? Um, because it's quite sure. an abstract thing, I think. And then <laughs> um, what you've done over the past 20 years up until now, and then we'll take it from there. Great. Yeah, I was I was just I was interested in democracy, particularly about, you know, people engaging in democracy when I was much younger. And I thought, who could ever have a career in that? <laughs> and so I, I went to graduate school in public administration thinking that would be relevant. And I got lucky. Uh, I was hired when I was in grad school by an organization called Everyday Democracy which very quickly sent me, started sending me to communities to try to help them engage people in all kinds of public issues um, at the time. This was in the mid nineties. One of the most common issues people were dealing with was issues of race and difference. That was a big Mm. you know, part of a lot of these projects, Uh, but it was not the only one budgeting, uh, K-12 education, how to improve the schools, all sorts of things. And what was happening during that time was a kind of a wave of innovation in democracy and kind of participatory democracy, which had to do with face-to-face uh, deliberative sessions, getting large numbers of people mm-hmm. together uh, in small groups to talk about a big issue in their community and what, could they, what they could do about it, what their elected officials, what they wanted them to do about it, and, and so on. It'd be really interesting to, to hear up and, you know, how you got to where you are now yeah. and sort of the success stories along the way, because it's definitely something okay. that's not broadcasted enough, I think, the fact that there's lots of innovation going on in this space. Yeah. Well, in the, in the, okay. In that first wave of innovation, uh, which had to do with face-to-face deliberative processes, there were lots of interesting outcomes on race and all kinds of other issues. Uh, you, people changed hiring practices for police departments, for example, or they built a new school mm-hmm. or a, a, a shopping center. There were things you could point to and say, wow, that this happened. And some of them were very tangible sorts of things in addition to kind of the learning and the relationship building that people were doing. Um, so th- there were some great and inspiring outcomes. But at the same time, I felt looking back on it years later that we didn't change the institutions. We didn't change the systems. We didn't change fundamentally how communities worked. So that even when these Mm -hmm. processes were very, very successful, 
they didn't have that lasting imprint on police community relations or other private, you know, other forms of equity. And so, you know, moving along in my career, I started working in other organizations. I, I ran a, a network called the Deliberative Democracy Consortium. And one of the things that that let me do was, was to really get a better sense of what was happening in other countries. And, and I saw in other places like Brazil and India and South Africa, that, that their responses to the kind of problems of democracy were more, much more systemic. It wasn't just an occasional project right. or an occasional process. It was, how do we change the way that governance works, particularly at the local level, that, that kind of allow people a better way of kind of being part of public problem solving and decision making. And along the same time, and this is the early 2000s, another wave of in democracy innovation was cresting, and that's the wave that had to do with tech. You know, in, in all kinds of ways for right. people to be engaged with one another, with officials, with policymaking, all kinds of ways for people to, uh, you know, give their opinions, rank ideas, give some money, volunteer their time. You know, all kinds of things were happening. Unfortunately, some of the same weaknesses were evident. <laughs> that second wave of innovation didn't learn enough from the first. And so just like the first was about standalone processes and projects, the second was about standalone apps and platforms and tools and not enough okay. about changing the institutions or changing the systems. Can I ask quickly, why wouldn't, it, why wouldn't changing enough processes change the system? Because they're really hard to do. <laughs> yeah, mo most, of these, most of these attempts to get in people engaged, they have lots of great outcomes if you do them well, but it's a lot of time. It's a lot of, um, you know, a, a lot of effort, particularly staff, sometimes money, but mainly staff time to, to, and, and recruitment time. You know, you, the hardest thing with public participation is bringing people to the table, you know, and so, and that involves creating relationships of trust. It involves a lot of communication. That, um, so it's hard to do. And so, mm -hmm. you know, once you do it, it you know, it's, it's kind of very hard to then do it all over again. <laughs> no, right. So meanwhile, we have, especially in the United States, we have lots of existing infrastructure for citizen engagement, you know, local governments, state governments, all kinds of institutions interact with the public in these various regular, regular sorts of ways. And most of them are terrible. <laughs> most mm -hmm. public meetings, public hearings, uh, make people very frustrated. And most of the kind of standard ways for people to interact online as well are pretty traditional and they don't really don't, they're not enough for anyone. They don't, they're not helpful. Uh, and so we yeah. have this kind of standard routine, standard processes, which even though they're not very good, keep going on and on. And meanwhile, we keep kind of trying to organize these other things on the side, which are better, but they are, you know, they, they you know, they, they're kind of, um, they're not accepted. It's a way that the institution generally works. Right. Okay. <laughs> and, and, so, and I'm not sure that um, I, a lot of work to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm not sure, part of our, I'm not sure that answers your question about why does, why do I, I mean, I think part of the, part of the answer to your question is, first of all, we have a very kind of, uh, we're kind of trapped in our assumptions about how democracy can work in the U.S. and most of the, mm -hmm. not just the U.S., most of the kind of supposedly advanced democracies. We kind of think of it as mm -hmm. something that frustrates us, but not something that we can change. People don't think about, yeah. you know, they think of democracy as a static thing. Let's save democracy. You know, they don't think about improving it. Um, and so part of it is just yeah. that assumption that these things can't be improved. Part of it also is that the legal, the laws around public engagement have been around for a long time and they just, you know, they're, they're, they end up getting in the way. They were adopted, most of them, at least 50 to 75 years ago. They're pre-internet, you know, so that we have this kind of calcified legal system and this kind of these old attitudes about democracy that we need to get rid of. Can you give some examples of some calcified laws that are standing in the way of public engagement? Well, so, you know, um, there's lots of uh, laws which kind of require that strictly regulate how public officials can talk to each other or can, or can talk to their constituents. And so you right. can't have, you know, two city council members together with a group of 10 citizens in, in many, many cases. And these are mainly state laws, so I make generalizations. And so, and then um, when the internet, of course, came along, then none of these laws were really easy to interpret. You know, if, you know, if uh, two members of city council are on a Twitter thread, does that mean, you know, <laughs> you know are, are they yeah. in a chat room somewhere? Does that against, you know, so there's all kinds of laws, which, and the reason for the laws was to ensure transparency. They were adopted a hundred years ago or 50 to hundred years ago to try to make sure that, that 
you know, backroom deals weren't being made and, you know, all this sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So they're adopted for good reasons, but they're also adopted according to a mid 20th century understanding of how transparency can occur, which means mm-hmm. a meeting that everyone's at in person, somebody's taking notes or, you know, the city clerk or whoever, you know, and those notes are, are posted. They're in a big binder at city hall. You can, people can go look at them or journalists can go look at them so you can kind of tr- track who said what to who. So that, mm-hmm. you know, in the mid 20th century was enough to prevent, um, you know, backroom deals in many cases, or at least to reduce corruption. Um, and it's not the way you do transparency now, obviously, with the technologies yeah. we have. So the laws yeah. we need now should, should you know, kind of, um, should, accom- should, should take advantage of those technologies and kind of enforce a 21st century kind of understanding of, of, of uh, transparency. It seems to me that a lot of the pushback against involving tech into democracy or democratic processes is this fear of people getting hacked or fraud or whatever. Um, but at the, by the same token, we use tech for absolutely everything else yeah. and nobody's really too afraid of that going wrong. So is it that um, there is a willingness or a sort of deliberate subversion on the part of uh, those in power to not want to use tech to increase transparency and therefore holding on to these calcified laws? Yeah, that could be part of it. And it also, you know, I think, people in public office tend to be older. And so, you know, they're, they're my age or older, many of them. So they're not used to it. They didn't grow up with technology the way that, you know, people in their twenties and thirties did. So that's certainly part of it as well. Um, you know, cybersecurity is, you know, it is a serious matter. I mean, it is, you know, things can yeah. be hacked. I mean, so, you know, so, but as you say, it's something that we deal with in just about every aspect of our lives now. So it's not, you know, like that should be a reason not to use technology in the public sphere. Mm. Certainly, we see in um, uh, countries like, you know, Malaysia, for example, mm-hmm. where I did some reporting on this, um, they will sort of refusing to um, allow for people to vote online because they don't want the indigenous people to have easy access to voting. Mm-hmm. And, they're, you know, the, the, the state line is, you know, about voter fraud and about, uh, you know, wanting to run a fair election. And then by the same token, you have videos of these politicians handing out bribes like fistfuls of cash (laughs) handing out bribes and taking in um people's voter cards in return Mm. so that they can't vote on election day wow so they get a day's worth of salary in exchange for their voting card um so certainly after seeing examples of that it's uh, certainly in nations that um are run in a more overtly authoritarian matter um it does make you wonder why you know advanced democracies Mm. quote unquote are not willing to push the envelope and improve, yeah. as you said. I think that was so interesting. Improve democracy rather than save it. Right. Yeah. No. All right. So what what's going wrong with our democracy? I would love your professional opinion because I think everybody has this sense that the the empire is crumbling around <laughs> us and things are just going wrong. And you know, we've got an ex president who was a maniac to begin with, and now he's been raided by the FBI because you know he probably had some you know crazy documents like. What went wrong? <laughs> and what do we do about it? <laughs> well, I think, you know, basically what we have now, we have institutions and professions which were developed about 100 years ago. In the program, most of what we see now in the way governments work, police departments, school systems, all these things, that came to be about, 20, you know, about 100 years ago during the progressive era. They kind of achieved their current form then. The ways that they interact with the public basically started, you know, cur- achieved their current form around then. Lots of public facing professions, you know, city management, policing, social work, planning, all kinds of things were born in that era. And they, uh, they, all of those things were created for good reasons to, to reduce corruption, to deal with public health, to do, you know, all kinds of things that were kind of big problems of the turn of the 20th, from the 19th to the 20th century. And so in many ways, these things did their job. They were good. Um, in many ways, they helped defeat the depression, win a world, world war, you know, all those sorts of things. And yet mm. what they do is they isolate experts and electeds, elected officials, you know, from the public. Okay. They give, you know, that because they're trying to get, get this policymaking, decision-making away from corrupt influences, you know, they, they were, they kind of raised it up away from where ordinary citizens could participate. And they took kind of politics out of the community and more to its own kind of professionalized public sphere. And that, you know, so that served us well in many ways, like I said, but at the same time, citizens are now different. <laughs> people are different mm. than they were 100 years ago or 50 or 20 years ago. You know, people's 
you know, if you just look at the basic stuff, people's level of education, literacy, numeracy, that's gone up and up and up for a hundred years. And it's trama- dramatically different than it was even mm. 50 years ago. Um, people's um, deference toward authority of all time, of all kinds. I mean, that, that peaked in the seventies and it's gone down steadily ever since. So whether it's religious authority or political or community or whatever, you, people are less likely to just let, you know, the decision makers, uh, you know, have all the say. And then of course you got the internet, which comes along and has all kinds of impacts, you know, so we have 21st century citizens who are very different and we have 20 and they can, they not only have different expectations, they have different things that they can contribute. They have different capacities that they, than they did. Uh, and so we have these 21st century citizens who are fundamentally different. And we have these 20th century se- institutions and professions, which really are having mm. a hard time keeping up. So that's the fundamental, very big picture mismatch, which is, you know, kind of means that our democracy, the way it works is fairly uh, uh, out of date. Okay. But if, um, how do we protect that, which is good in an institution or in a process? If also we need to update it uh, very often, you know, like, the, and I think the biggest um, example is this furor around the American Constitution. Mm. Um, it's a really, really good example that this document can be amended and it should be amended. Right. But by the same token, like, how do you stop that capacity for amendment being abused if, you know, a strong man comes into power sure. um, as he did right. <laughs> very recently? Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, there are, uh, like you say, you know, the constitution can be amended and there's the way that that happens is you know, the, designed to prevent a strong man or a woman or anyone from, from kind of, you know, ruling the process. I mean, you know, so, so we could do that. And, and, and certainly, uh, you know, at other levels of government we do, and we can, and, and sometimes organizations do, for example, uh, there's something called the model city charter which has been around since 1902, I think, and it was, is maintained by the National Civic League. And it's basically the legal template, you know, for the local charter between a government and its citizens. And it's been updated, you know, a number of times over the years. So the ninth update, right. the ninth edition just came out. And the ninth edition was the first one to uphold the principle of equity and the principle of engagement and the way that local governance is supposed to work. And there's lots of kind of how-to stuff about, you know, not just, yes, you should do this, but also here's how you so Fantastic. That, that gives a, you know, that, that sort of resource allows governments to say, hey, let's kind of redo this, you know, um, and let's re in the process, let's think with our citizens about how we want to work together. Um, that, that's eminently doable. And you could do it in a way that, that, you know, no single group can, you know, or single person can hijack it. And is that national across the United States, that charter? Yeah, it's, it's a model charter. So any, any city, I, I, I think, you know, most city government charters are based on it in some way, you know, so some of them, you know, they may have been passed in 1925 or whatever, but, but they're at an much earlier version of the charter, but, but, you know, yes, it's, it's a resource that cities around the country use. Let's take a little um, sidetrack and then we'll come back to this. I would just be really interested to know if there's been much press around that. And if you think there's enough press in general around um, democratic, innovative Mm -hmm. democratic processes, and if not whether you think more press coverage would help. Yeah, I think, well, yeah, certainly I think there should be in there. There mm-hmm. isn't very much of it. There's only a few journalists out there. Um, Joe Matthews uh, at Zocalo Public Square is one noteworthy example. But, uh, you know, there's only a few people like that who are reporting on this sort of thing. And most journalists, seems to me, are trapped in the same kind of old mindset. You know, democracy is not something that changes. You know, it's something we have to defend or attack. Yeah, you know, but mm. it's it's not something that can be improved, and so and and, and also you know most most um, journalists you know, are, are kind of attuned to looking for conflict. So examples of a city working with citizens to figure out how it's going to work together, or you know, yeah. you know different organizations of the community saying, "Hey, we have this particular problem. Let's come up with some cross sector solution." You know that sort of thing. You know tends not to you know um, you know get the attention of journalists because there's not enough conflict involved. So, yeah, I, and I think it would be helpful not only to kind of, you know, show that these sorts of things, you know, can change and that, that these sorts of things are possible, that improvement is possible, but also kind of good journalism it could kind of show some of the different options, you know, in a different way. There's different design questions. I mean, the, the framers of the Constitution 
faced a bunch of design questions <laughs> about how, yeah. how to deal with rights and how to deal with with uh, representation and all kinds of things. And so the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, any Constitution is a product of a bunch of design decisions. Well, we can return to those decisions and 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 think about them in the light of the current needs and technologies and and um, and what people want today, and and kind of think of it as a as a design problem, not just you know. Uh, you know, something that we have to fight over. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So the thing, the the debate that's going on in the UK at the moment, well, at the moment, it has been going on for a while, is um, the first past the post system yeah. of voting. Mm -hmm. um, because when you have one behemoth, you know, party on one side right. and then the opposition, which is fractured into lots of really good parties with lots of different ideas, and obviously it's the nars that get voted in. Um, and so that's sort of the main thing. Uh, certainly, uh, it was meant to be at the Labour Party conference. It was meant to be the first point of discussion. Right. Like, let's let's campaign to change the system to, I don't know, mm -hmm. single transferable vote or just something, proportional representation, something else. Right. Um, in your opinion, is that the first step that would need to happen in democratic countries, that changing the voting system to get away from these very sort right. of simple first past the post, or is there another step that we're missing? Yeah, I don't, I don't think it is the first step. Um, oh, interesting. Because I, I mean, there's a, and, and I, there are many voting reforms, which I support, you know, I, I mean, I, I am not a voting expert, so I, I, you know, I, I, they sound good to me and I, and I would, I would mm. be interested in them or using them, but, uh, I don't think any of them solves the fundamental problem, which is that people want more of a voice. You know, they want more choice. They want to be heard and they don't just want to be represented. They do want to be represented. <laughs> they do want to have elected officials. They want to have a parliament, a Congress, or, you know, they want the city council. They want those things. It's not like they want to make all the decisions all the time. In fact, most people are, probably were willing to leave 95% of the decisions in public, public realm to the experts, to the officials, whatever. But there's the 5% at least that they want to be part of. Um, it, yeah. And some of them are kind of, decisions that are kind of setting the course for the community, the, the decisions that will kind of influence other smaller decisions. Some of them are decisions that are focused on their particular lives and that, you know, are you building something across the street from my house or, you know, things that yeah. are, what are you changing? Are you making it my kid's school? You know, so, so there's, there's some decisions that people want to be part of and, and they don't feel they have a voice in things like that. And voting for another person to make those decisions does not give them a voice. So I don't think that you, you know, that, uh, first past the post or any other voting reform is going to lead, is going to satisfy people as far as they want, what they want out of public life today. And I also don't think, at least in the U S those kinds of voting decisions, they're very, they're very the voting reforms. They're very hard to enact. I mean, they, you know, you know, a lot of, it becomes a partisan thing in the U.S. very quickly. Um, and so it's, it's, it's hard for them to do. I, I kind of think a lot of those voting changes will only happen if, and when, people have some other kinds of roles that they can play, which are more meaningful in public policy making, um, aside from just voting for representatives. Hey, interesting. It, I'm no expert, but it, it sounds a little bit like a chicken in the egg scenario, because yeah. if you changed, if you, if you got more proportional representation in, I think that that would galvanize the population to be more willing to get politically engaged because their vote actually counts for something. Yeah. And yet... Yes, you're right. How do we how do we even get there without citizens using their voices more fervently yeah. to say this is something that we absolutely need? So, what kind of roles can citizens take? Can you walk us through some <laughs> models of of participatory democracy or uh, just better ways of organizing that is facilitated by the 21st century? Sure. So, okay, I'll give you three different things that kind of emerged. One of the first types of things that emerged in the mid 90s all over the world. Uh, you know, and in some ways you could say they've been going on for centuries, but, but, but they kind of in a current form, you know, small group deliberative processes, you know, getting large numbers of people together, maybe you might have 500 or a thousand people, but in groups of 10, you know, and you have a facilitator there and people, there's a kind of a tried and true sequence of the discussions where people start out by talking about their experiences, why they care about the issue, why they care about the community. They get to know each other better. They get to know experts and officials better. Then they kind of start looking at the next phase. They start looking at different options on the table. They learn more together. They try to look, figure out, well, what is, what is the real situation here? Where, what's the data say? What, you know, they, they kind of learn together more of the facts about something. They look at different options for doing something about it. 
in the final kind of step in that sequence, they figure out what they want. To, what do they want to do? What do they want to recommend to officials, other decision makers, and so on and so forth. So that's that's a fairly generic <laughs> form of participation, which happens all over the world. Another one which kind of emerged around the same time period that really, but didn't really, um, you know, travel to other countries outside Brazil until maybe the late 90s is participatory budgeting, which ha has some of those same kind of features, people talking about their experiences uh, and talking, making recommendations. But P PB, you know, is about money. You know, it's about kind of, you're saying, you know, we have a pot of money. Um, how are we going to allocate that money? Bless you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> in ways, how are we going to allocate the money in ways that kind of, you know, will meet the goals and needs we have as a neighborhood residency. And there's, PB has, has um, spread all over the world. It's diversified. It's, it's, you know, lots and lots of different ways of doing it. Some more successful than others. Some really kind of, you know, attached to that particular community, that culture or whatever. But that's, that's another type of participation. And then a third that's uh, also emerged is um, similar in that it's using those kinds of deliberative processes, but it's random sample. So basically you'd say, you know, for your country or your province or your state, you would uh, assemble 100 people you know, or 50 people who are um, kind of representative of the larger, you know, community. So they're, they're, you know, racially and demographically and age and all sorts of things, they represent their peers. And those people take part in a very intensive process on a particular issue or decision. And they hear from experts, there's, there's testimony. It's kind of, you know, it's a very kind of intensive process. And they come out on the other end with a set of suggestions or, or, or recommendations for elected officials or sometimes for voters. So sometimes this is done on ballot initiatives and referenda. So they're advising what their fellow citizens should vote on when it comes to that particular policy. So those are three different ways and they're kind of better for different sorts of things. Uh, that, but those are three different main families of participation which are happening now. Okay. Uh, um, I, have, I, okay, I, have, I have two questions. I've got yeah. two questions. Because like, my first question is with the... Um, Deliberative democracy, you get people in sort of small groups and a facilitator and they talk and da-da-da. Uh, why doesn't that work on an international scale then when countries come together in conferences? And then for, for the third model, um, you, you know, choosing a, a random group of citizens that represent everybody and then they get to hear the expert testimony mm -hmm. and then they advise on what should happen. Why don't our elected officials just do that? <laughs> like, why is it that citizens can do it better than elected officials? Oh, I see what you're saying. Well, let me take the second one first. I mean, part sure. of the problem is that elected officials have a very hard time compromising because their constituents won't let them, right? right. So that, this is part of the problem now with representative democracy, where people don't feel like they have a voice, is it, you know they're not in any kind of decision-making role. They're not really getting the same information. They're not hearing from one another, people who are different from them or have different opinions. You know, so they, they just want that what they want, but they don't really, you don't necessarily haven't been exposed to a lot of the facts or, you know, things like that, but they want their official to do what, what you know, to be on the side of the issue that they want. And so, and yeah. that's particularly evident, of course, in elections, particularly on big time controversial yeah. questions. So it's very easy, you know, to campaign against an incumbent and say, ah, oh, this person is against this thing and that thing and the other thing that you want. Let's vote them out, you know, for her out. Yeah. Um, so, so it's, um, people have a hard time endorsing compromise if they aren't at the table themselves, you know, if they aren't feeling heard, if they're not hearing from other people who are different from them or different opinions. Yeah. You know, so, so that's partly why purely representative system has a hard time in a, a day and an age where the ordinary citizen has expectations, you know, beyond what they did and less deference for authority than they did 50 years ago or hundred years ago. Um, so, so that's why, so, so those rep random sample sorts of things need a broader, you know, kind of engagement surrounding them. It can't just be the single exercise with the 50 people or 100 people. You've got to have ways to engage larger numbers of people. And certainly tech, various kinds of tech world engagement are good for this because you can, you know, yeah. you can bring in a much larger set of people, ask them their opinions, give them information, let them give yeah. opinions to the, to the members of the jury or the assembly. You know, there, there's lots of ways to, to kind of involve people in a way that it's not in a, as intensive but does give them a meaningful, you know, say in something. Um, so right. without that sort of second level, second, you know, tier of engagement, it's hard for elected officials even to go along with whatever the random sample 
you know, citizen jury or citizen assembly had to recommend. Why is it that if we, if we take away the pressure of representing constituents and having to win elections, is there something else in the psychology or the philosophy of being an elected official that fossilizes um, uh, their way of thinking or their way of understanding how systems yeah. evolve? that impinge their ability to be as creative as citizens? No, it, it, I, I think what happens is they simply, um, they come into their to office with a different assumption about what their role is going to be. Um, you know, okay. I, so I, years ago, I was working with a panel of local uh, official uh, city council members and mayors in the United States. And this was a panel that was about, this is a group of them that we were together for several years. And the, the, the kind of the focus was how do we do better forms of participation? And I thought, you know, I was going to be supporting them by offering the for tools and doing some research. With it. And I did that. But mm. the main thing was the emotional side. <laughs> it wasn't just the intellectual side. It was the fact that, you know, they'd gotten elected by their peers. With, what they thought was they got elected to make the decisions, you know, and they went into office and here they were. OK, I'm making decisions on the first time. They make, say, make some kind of controversial decision. All of a sudden, the people they thought were their friends are yelling at them. So right. they, they didn't, re and, they, and they thought, well, wait, wait, why don't, why don't people trust me? Uh, they voted for me. You know, why don't they want, and so, and so these officials, it was kind of like labeling the stages of grief. It was like a, an emotional process for them to kind of, you know, talk about, wait a minute, you know, why did I go to public service? You know, why, why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. why, you know, and so it, it, it was an emotional transition for them, not just intellectual one. To come out on the other end with a new understanding of their role, yes, they needed to be consulting and talking with people about the decisions. They needed to be giving people opportunity to help implement the, the solutions, not just rely on government to do all the implementing. You know, so but it, that was not. It was simply not what they expected. And so we do need to have more systems, more more training opportunities for people who are going into public office. There are some, like a political foundation, does some. Uh, you know, International City County Management Association. There are, there are some like that, but. We need to have more uh, of those sorts of training opportunities for people so that we, people aren't surprised when they get into office and they find that everyone they, they thought liked them is now yelling at them. <laughs> <laughs> and I suppose more participation between citizens and their officials would equally solve that problem because people would feel like they had been a part of the decision-making right. process. Yeah, 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 exactly. And then and they just, you, you build trust that way. You know, you, you're not going to yeah. agree with, everyone you're not going to agree with your mayor all yeah. the time you know she or, yeah. or he's going to make decisions you know but but if you have a good feel for that person you know they're doing a good job they're doing their best you know their kid goes to the same high school my kid goes to they live in this neighborhood you know people have some of those kind of personal connections and a, a sense of the other individual they have some empathy um then that's what allows you to kind of say oh well this person didn't what they, i don't know why they did that but you know i'll, I'll stick with it as opposed to the incredible you know, polarization that we have now where just about any mistake or any disagreement is just yeah. become such, so much more, um, you know, rife with emotion than it should be. Do you have data on cities or uh, communities that are using um, any of these different models? Do you have data on how they have reacted during this polarized time? Like, are they managing it better? Then, um, what's well, like a really polarized place? I don't know, just everywhere else. <laughs> yeah. Like, for example, it'd be really interesting to see if there were less um, shootings in those cities or states or communities right. than in the rest of the United States. Yeah. So, in general, so um, I, I wrote a piece about, um, you know, research on the effect of participation on polarization, wrote something or uh, a couple things that oh, you, you can link to. One is using Participedia. Participedia is a great resource. It has all these different examples from all over the world of public participation and what people are doing, both the, the kind of the stories of, of those communities or those places and also the tools they use and, and the organizations involved and so on. Uh, so mm -hmm. I did write a piece about how you can use Participedia to find some of those kinds of examples on polarization itself. Um, I think in general, there's a fair amount of data suggesting that when people uh, get together in these more deliberative sorts of encounters, yes, they build empathy. They're less likely to be acting in polarized ways. They're less likely to kind of 
is trustful of one another, you know, those sorts of things. So there's, there, that is relatively easy to kind of document. It's harder to document, you know, at the city level, you know, you know what I mean? It, mm. The city's done these sorts of things for a number of years. And keep in mind, there's not that many cities that have done this, certainly in the U.S. in any yeah. kind of, you know, sustained way. So you, you're looking at a small, a small universe of places. <laughs> um, yeah. so, and it's also just hard to kind of, to show any causation, you know, at a city level, because there's so much other stuff going on. But we do know that at like, you know, the level of you and me or level of a small group, when people get together in a good way, in a good process, they can deal with polarization fairly easily. I suppose that leads me then to ask, is it possible to create and run a sustainable, fair, deliberative democracy on a nation state level? And I understand that it's meant to be this kind of bottom up process. But when we take a country that is as big geographically diverse as the United States, I mean, is it possible? Are we going to have to break down into smaller groups in order to do better? Well, that was certainly I think <laughs> that would help. And we could we can support communities in a variety of ways um, to build the kind of civic infrastructure that they need, you know, at the local level to do more of that. So that's certainly, you know, one thing that we can and should be doing. Some foundations are looking at that. You know, some other organizations are working on that sort of thing. Um, Congress has a Building Civic Bridges Act about that. So so there's certainly lots of things that, that should be put in place at the local level that would be helpful. Um, and then also, you know, as opposed to 50 years ago, we have all kinds of technologies that can aggregate that. You know, they, they, you know, if you get people together in good processes in v different places all over the country, you can you can show and in fact, you can show people in real time. You know, um, I was involved in a process um, as part of Obama's National Dialogue on Mental Health where we use texting and they, they were kind of texting. It was texting based engagement. And so you could be together mm. with two or three other people in this, you know, face to face, you know, this very you know small setting. But and you're working through the questions and talking about them together, looking at the different data about mental health. And then when you're answering these kind of questions, you know, you say, oh, I think, you know, the answer should be B. And then immediately kind of shows you, well, yeah, and, uh, you know, thousands of other people across the country doing the same process. They also said B or 60% said B or 20% said A. So you can, you can use that technology to kind of aggregate up from lots and lots of small, mm -hmm. intimate sorts of discussions in a ways that help people feel like they're part of a much larger discussion and help decision makers see ah, across the country where people are really looking at this, talking to each other. Look, really looking at the data, here are the things that they said. So, so in some ways, it's so much easier to, to tackle this at a national level than we think, and certainly much easier uh, than it would have been even 20 years ago. Okay, so it's not, I'm going to keep pushing here. It's not that the nation state is one of those old concepts that is fossilized and impeding progress. Right. Well, or I don't know. It? I mean, some, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, yeah, that's an interesting argument. I'm not sure I, I have I have any expertise to comment on. I mean, I, I think it's probably true yeah. that a lot of our public problems are either neighborhood level or metro region level or global. And of course, our systems mm. of governance are not neighborhood, regional, global. They're local, state, federal. So there's a kind of a basic mismatch there. Yeah. Um, but you could you, you can do good public participation at all six of those levels. It's not necessarily easy, mm -hmm. um, but we should be mm -hmm. building the machinery for it at all those levels. I'd be very interested to know how international conferences, like the COP conferences, could be run better using some of these techniques. Mm. Because I think it is incredibly frustrating as citizens to see so much money and resources and time and PR go into right. creating these conferences and then to come out the other side with, um, well, nobody's sticking to the agreement we made last time and the agreement that we wanted to make this time, we've had to compromise on uh, a lot of. So really nothing particularly happened, uh, <laughs> but we're going to do it again next year though. It's yeah. like, what, how, <laughs> you know, the, the planet's on fire. What's going on? Like, yeah. how can these politicians use the practices of deliberative democracy to make better decisions or had, do we do we need to be engaging citizens in those huge international, extremely complex, you know, questions and and sure. meetings? Sure. Yeah. No, I think you do. Otherwise, there's no. I mean, you, you. I think part of this this problem, part of the challenge now of this mismatch between institutions and and citizens is mm. you can't just you know 
hand the whole thing over to the elected officials. You can't just expect government to right. do it. You've got to have citizens involved. And there's a zillion ways you can do that. I mean, in, in a international conference, you know, it could have random sample sorts of processes like a citizen assembly or jury. It could have lots of, you know, broad based digital engagement for people to rank ideas or to comment on things or to prioritize. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's lots of ways to do that. There's lots of ways you could have, you know, small groups meeting all over the world in, you know, in person in ways yeah. that are aggregatable. Um, you know, there's many, many ways to kind of introduce a citizen element to conferences, which would really enrich them and make them more likely to, to, to succeed and, and more, give more uh, evidence of political will to the elected officials so that they can feel comfortable voting for things that they may want to vote for, but they feel they're going to get punished for the next time they try to get elect, reelected. So I think that that's, that's important. It's interesting because I think the first thing that comes to mind is that, you know, we have the IPCC report, mm -hmm. um, which obviously is a group of citizens. They're scientists, but they are also equally citizens. They spend mm -hmm. three years working on this thing. Um, in small groups, mm -hmm. going through data and making recommendations. Right. And those recommendations are then go to elected officials and are watered right. down at the, uh, you know, at the conference because they all have to agree on what goes on, what can be done. Um, so what is, I would just want to, both for myself and for listeners, like what is, what is a citizen? Like, how is it that a citizen could have more weight in that process than a scientist who is an expert. What's like? Let's really get into the relationship between citizen and elected official, and what a citizen should be, and how we should go about making better citizens. Well, um, I mean, so one part of that is there should be a relationship mm -hmm. between citizens and scientists as well. And many scientists are are working on this, doing this sort of thing. I mean, mm -hmm. the tr traditional format was not like that. It was you know, scientists and other experts all by themselves in the ivory tower, thinking big thoughts and making recommendations and not necessarily caring as much about, about what um, ordinary people thought or, or did. But now, you know, there's lots of people trying to kind of break that barrier down. And so, so yeah. part of the engagement I was describing earlier could also involve, you know, experts, uh, scientists, other people, and kind of, you know, explaining to citizens and also taking feedback from them. So it's, it's you know, um, I did a, it's sure. got to be a two-way street. Um, I was working on a project uh, in New York City uh, in the neighborhood surrounding Jamaica Bay, which is, you know, the southern part of Brooklyn and Queens. And those are neighborhoods which are highly um, vulnerable to climate change because you know, what happened in Superstorm Sandy was flooding produced by a storm going right up the bay. Right. So, you know, climate change is a, an immediate threat to people who are homeowners in you know, renters in these areas. And part of the process was involving citizens, scientists and citizens and policymakers. And this is just a small little thing that we did. But what we did, one of the things we did was we played Jeopardy. <laughs> we created an engagement game, you know, modeled on Jeopardy, which had, mm -hmm. you know, some of the categories were science related sorts of things to know. Some of them were policy related things. How do these processes work and how do you, you know, get in touch with your legislator or whatever. And then some of them were citizen things about their neighborhood, what they cared about it, what they were concerned about yeah. related to the planet. And so, yeah. you know, putting the, all of those categories, you know, across the top of the board, like you do in Jeopardy, allowed us to say, well, all these forms of knowledge are important and valuable. And the yeah. people in the different areas should know about each other and about what they care about, what they know. And so if we can kind of approach a relationship between experts, officials, and citizens in that way, it allows for better policymaking, more informed policymaking. One thing that happens when you engage them well is that citizens come out of that which mu with much greater uh, trust and respect for expertise, you know, as, as opposed to mm. right now. I mean, you know, science is yeah. often viewed as, as if it's just PR or something like that. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and when you actually give people a real opportunity, you know, to talk to each other and talk with an expert, they have usually come out of that with a much greater respect for, for the facts and an understanding of what the facts are. Excellent. I hadn't thought about it in that respect as well, how this process could be used for other areas outside of, you know, democracy. But I suppose what I'm trying to get at uh, in a very abstract way is like this concept of a citizen and the fact that yeah. the, a citizen does hold more weight, say, than an expert, beca purely because uh, an elected official uh, has to get voted back in or if you have a different process, they have to engage with their constituents. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, 
elected officials right now can ignore experts or they can buy different experts that say the opposite thing. And yet there is something, I just find there's something particularly strange about this period that we are, are going through because it seems to be the most powerful position almost to be a citizen mm -hmm. in an quote unquote advanced democracy. Mm -hmm. And yet there's something about the way that we run things that neuters that power yeah. incredibly. So, I mean, as you said, the fact that we have more educated citizens now, the fact that we are, are less deferent to authority, like it just seems the best moment in history to be an active and engaged citizen. Mm -hmm. Um, and to be able to wield power right. over, or mm, that's a bit dramatic and a bit uh, violent, uh, and it, be able to I demand attention <laughs> from your elected official. Yeah, 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 something, something to that effect. Right. Um, power. right. And yet it's just not happening. Yeah. Yeah. No, so what, please, go on, please. Well, it's a shame. You're right. I absolutely agree. And not, not only because people can be part of decision making and policy making in, in, a, in a very helpful sort of way, but also because they can help implement solutions. And in fact, for many of yeah. these things, you need them. <laughs> you know, we can't confront climate yeah. change without actions taken by huge numbers of people in their daily lives. Simple things. You know, so when you're talking about climate change or pandemics or safety or all kinds of issues or issues of race and difference, you need regular people to do stuff, you know, and simply do simple, easy things. And if you can make that happen on a large scale, you can have a, a great impact. So there's that kind of, mm. you need to be treating people as potential allies and implementers of ideas. Also, they can do things as volunteers that are very sophisticated and, you know, and, and much more, um, you know, effective than they could, you know, there's because of the tools they have, because of the internet, because of the levels of education sure. that people have, there's, there's, you know, thinking of people as a, both advanced and basic problem solvers, you know, that should be part of this kind of notion of citizen. And then one final thing is just that. Um, Please, another yeah. kind of interesting type of research shows the strength of social networks, right? So that basically, okay. if you are in a community, if, if you are surrounded by a community of people, if you're part of a network and it's family, friends, colleagues, whatever, if you have a strong social network, you are healthier physically. You're better able to find a job and keep it. You're better able to kind of get education when you need it. it, it you know, uh, you're better able to deal with a natural disaster when it arrives. I mean, there's all mm. kinds of data now showing the power of those sorts of just the basic social networks. So there's another reason there to strengthen, to do engagement on a very large scale, on a very local scale, aggregated and, and you know, and, um, you know, decentralized. But basically those sorts of th that, that basic level of connection can also in and of itself help us deal with these enormous, you know, social problems that we face and we're, we're paying, you know, we're creating policies on them. We can also be kind of doing the most basic thing that may have an even greater impact on the policy. It's funny because you get to a certain stage. I think with every one of these conversations that I get to a stage where I'm like, oh, it's about it. There's something about power in all of this. <laughs> something about power and the power vacuum and da, da, da. And like, I can't quite put my finger on, um, uh, what I think, whether or not people are, um, very, very corrupt and bad or whether or not, you know, we have a systemic problem or it's some kind of, you know, Taoist mix of, of both. Um, but in everything that you're saying, I think the, the thing that comes to mind is sort of, you know, a bit Marxist, a bit like, well, you know, the system right now produces laborers and you want, you want people to be laborers because, you, you know, capitalism uh, and capitalists need laborers and you don't want people really to be active citizens. And that's why we alienate and we isolate and we break down communities into these little silos of individualism because it makes people, it makes it harder for people to live a good life and harder, you know, the harder it is to live a good life, the less time that you have to be engaged with your wider community and for life to be less precarious so that you can think about others and create a better world for others. Um, so I suppose without asking you some ridiculously abstract question about power, <laughs> which I will try to refrain from doing because I don't think anybody has the answer to that. Um, what can citizens do now to try to create these processes, mm -hmm. given that I think we can safely say there are powerful barriers yeah. to um, things going better for the everyday person right. right now in most advanced democracies, certainly the United States and the United Kingdom, it is madness right now. Right. 
So what are the barriers to overcome and, and how can citizens begin to overcome those? Well, I think part of your abstract part of that is very important, <laughs> which is we have this kind of, we generally have this kind of old fashioned view of power that is zero sum. You know, this other person has mm. all and I have not, or he, he or she has, you know, 20% of it, you know, you know and, and that's yeah. never been true. You know, and, and I, I you know, Hannah yeah. Arendt, is a political, she talked about communicative power. Mm-hmm. Basically, you can build power in all kinds of different settings. Um, and so it's not that you have to necessarily strip it from some elected official or somebody else. You can build it and, and you can figure out. And part of the challenge is how do you figure out, you know, infrastructure for communities and countries which mm. allows people to build power as they need it, you know, to be, to have a voice, to meet other people of similar concerns, to meet people who have different opinions and, and work it out with them, negotiate, you know, that, that's, that's the kind of machinery we need to allow citizens to be part of the power building and the power sharing and the power using and, and not kind of just delegating it or all of it over to elected officials. By the way, when I talked about those local officials earlier in the time about the kind of emotional process, one of the things that it was a common thing that they said was that I gave away power in order to gain more power. You know, in other words, they, they realized it wasn't just me making the decisions. People didn't want me to do that. And, that, and it was hard for me to deal with because I thought that was going to be my role. But I realized that as I made space for people to be part of decision making, to give meaningful input, to, to have a give and take among between me and them or between, that, between different groups of people, that we t- collectively built more power together you know, to deal with the problems. Uh, and, and, and so that, 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 you know, was helpful to them. And so that, that, you know, figuring out how do we do that is, is an important question. It, it's still frustrating because I feel like bottom up management has been something that's been discussed like the past sort of yeah. 10 years in, in business and it became quite, um, sexy people want to do it, you know, Starbucks, that is how they run their organization and they've had huge success. It's like, uh, last time I checked, I was a little bit obsessed with this about a year ago. There was like five organizations that use this like completely bottom up management structure. Mm-hmm. Um, in which people also don't have defined roles. Right. So you build a team for each project depending on skills. And whenever you're hiring somebody, you hire a person based on their skill set and how that can complement the rest of the team skill set rather than you are going to be our accountant or our right. you know, PR, whatever. And so the, even the business world is kind of like taking off an understanding that yeah. it needs happier employees right. and, and more, you know, the more creativity and the more space that people are given, things tend to go better for the organization as a whole. And yet, um, democracy is just like so far behind. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, think, I think that's true. I think the private sector in many cases is, has done more experimentation, has given people greater say in things. You know, I, I don't want to candy coat it, it's, it's, but, it, but I think yeah, you're sure. right. There's more of that happening. And it, the, the reason it's happening is because it's profitable, because it, as you say, yeah. it does lead to more creativity. It does lead to better decisions because the people closest to them are making them. It does lead to people being happier and feeling more in control of things. And so that's all good for the company. It's good for the bottom line. So it, it could be good for the bottom line for us in the public sector as well. You know, so we, we should pursue that. And then one, I think one one lever, and you mentioned it earlier, is giving people a chance to vote for these sorts of things. You mentioned in Chile, where people, they asked, mm. you know, they had a plebiscite or whatever to ask people if they wanted to have a citizen assembly, and they said yes. And it's true that when you give people those sorts of choices, they, those things are appealing. Um, yeah. A couple of years ago, uh, New York City had a vote on whether participatory budgeting should be citywide, and people voted for it overwhelmingly. Um, so yeah. when, when you give them these kinds of opportunities, we, we did it when I was at Public Agenda, we did a polling process, a national survey called the Yankelovich Democracy Monitor, which asked people what kinds of democratic reforms they supported and gave them lots of different kinds of options, you know, TV and citizen assemblies, and deliberation, all kinds of stuff. And in general, people voted for all of them. You know, and yeah. it, was, it was not a partisan thing. It, you know, Republicans and Democrats were both in favor of most of these things. So, you know, if you, that is a lever perhaps to, to use more often, not only because if you get things voted on, then they, of course, they will, you know, become, they will happen. Also because you'll wake officials up to the electoral appeal. And this is something that I've been confused about for a while. Why don't more officials say, hey, elect me and I'm going to give you a say in this or a say in that, or I'm going to do a process on this issue that you care about, you know, 
that seems to be a winning electoral message. And we have some data actually in different countries showing that when elect, when candidates say those sorts of things, they're more likely to get elected. I don't understand why more of them do. I, I guess it's for the reasons that I talked about earlier, they, they think that they, you know, the role of being an elected official is the opportunity to make all the decisions. So maybe that's why they're not, you know, when they're, they're running for office, maybe they're just not open to mm. anything else. I don't know. But, but, but I would hope mm. that as you show the, the popular appeal of some of these kinds of democracy innovations and reforms, that it would become something that would, would spread, you know, in that way, because then campaigns, people were talking. Definitely. Although, of course, as a Brit, alarm bells are going off in my head because that was exactly how Brexit was, you know, constructed yeah, and no. then voted for. <laughs> That's a, that was a way to win vote. Well, so you have to have, um, when you're giving people a direct say on something, it shouldn't just be the vote. It should also mean, so we've had all kinds of processes, which um, were good processes that involved people getting information, deliberating, negotiating, all that kind of stuff, but they didn't lead to power, right? Deliberation without power. And then we've had power without any deliberation <laughs> in the case of Brexit and many other things. And, and I don't even say that as, I'm not saying that as an opponent or, or, or a proponent of, of Brexit. I mean, it's the fact of the matter is that a lot of people just simply didn't know what they were voting on and they were ruling it. <laughs> yeah, and they were lying <laughs> to Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so there was simply yeah. a case of a, an electorate not being informed enough. So, so you should have, Opportunities for people to have a meaningful say, and those should be combined with opportunities to learn more about them, to talk to other people, including people of different views, you know, so that you've got deliberation and power. Yeah, totally. I want to run through some examples of where these new systems or innovative systems or experiments are running, because I think that because such things don't really get a lot of press coverage, and I think because people can be a little bit afraid of change, especially during such a tumultuous time. And we need to have empathy for, for citizens around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly, I mean, I was having like a big debate over lunch uh, in my co-working space just last week. And somebody was um, saying, oh, but you know, like, uh, there is no alternative to capitalism, for example. Everything else fails. And I was like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> That's just fundamentally untrue. There's lots of different experiments. And then we were talking about democracy and like how this is the only way that things can work. And I was like, but it's not working. You know, come on. Mm. There are lots of examples. And I, um, thankfully, having interviewed Tom and Susan, I could like speak a little bit about some of them, the experiments that are going on. Um, and Taiwan as well, because I yep. interviewed John Alexander last week about what's happening in Taiwan. It was just amazing. Yeah. But what other examples are happening around the world that we can look to? And in particular, you know, it, if more are happening away from the Western world, because right. I feel that there is this real focus on that everything amazing comes out of the West right. um, since, you know, the Enlightenment. And actually, the opposite is true. Like so much more innovation, it seems to me, is happening on the other side of the world. And yeah. yet because of that, we're not really getting uh, wind of it. Yeah. Well, it, it is a very complicated question because some of the countries that mm. were the leading democratic innovators from, say, you know, 1990 to 2010 now have, you know, or would be authoritarian, you know, places like, you know, uh, Brazil, or India, and so on. So the yeah. Philippines as well. So it's, it's a very, very complicated yeah. picture. You've got local invasion, but national kind of pushback, you know, so, so there's no kind sure. of, there's no perfect situation, no, no nirvana, but. There are some great examples. Taiwan is certainly one of them. And it's a great example of using uh, technology, the form of the Polis yeah. platform, in addition to face-to-face -face workshops to kind of make uh, decisions about some things. Um, Ireland, you know, the use of citizen assemblies on, on abortion policy in a, in a country that you mm. wouldn't necessarily, um, on that issue, you wouldn't think people would be able to see eye to eye. And yet they did. Yeah. Um, some great examples I've written about at the local level are thing, places like uh, Santiago de Cali in uh, Colombia. Uh, which dealt with over many period, long period of time, they dealt with a situation where people were not just polarized, but violence in the streets. I mean, you know, because yeah. of the kind of legacy of, of the drug trade and so on. And that over many years has become a tremendous local, you know, community building process that gave people a say and helped people to kind of see each other eye to eye uh, and, and work together. So that's a great example. Um, the Philippines, an example of, of a non-governmental organization, the example of Rappler in the Philippines uh, and um, uh, the woman who just won the Nobel Prize. Uh, yes. Her name. Well, um, I, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but you, you know what I mean? <laughs> but, but part of it, she, she, she won the Nobel Prize. 
primarily because she is a, a, a a fearless journalist willing to stand up to yeah. tear So she is that. Rappler yeah. also is a tremendously interesting and innovative organization, which has engaged people in all kinds of ways in dealing with crime and dealing with uh, the typhoons that they have there in getting people to kind of give their opinions and rating how people are feeling about their community. You know, it's, it's a very interesting and innovative organization on, on the, on the journalism side that other other, you know, newspapers, journalism organizations are looking at. Fantastic. I love that last example as well. So it's so important to keep thinking as well. Innovation needs to happen in all of these, these industries, especially the ones that have been around for a little bit right. too long. Certainly a topic on this podcast that we don't have the time to go into right now, uh, but is sort of the fossilization of media and how it's not really fulfilling its role anymore. Yeah. Uh, Matt, I think we should wrap up there because I'm aware of the time, but thank you so much. And of course, my final thank question you. is, who would you like to platform? Gosh. Um, <laughs> how many people have you had on the tech side? Not enough. Okay. Um, Nigel Jacob, uh, who Nigel uh, Jacob. he worked for the city of Boston. He was one of the founders mm -hmm. of the mayor's office of new urban mechanics. <laughs> which oh, is quite cool. a name for a city department. <laughs> um, yeah. He's now a fellow, uh, I think, Northeastern. Um, but Nigel Jacob would be one person. He's, he's involved in all kinds of interesting tech-related democracy innovations uh, in Boston and elsewhere. Oh, fantastic. That would be brilliant. Matt, thank you so much. This is such a pleasure and so informative. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Great talking with you. If you want to learn more about Matt's work, I've put links to loads of resources in the description box below. Remember to subscribe to this channel if you're new here and share the episode if you enjoyed it. If you loved it, support Planet Critical on Patreon. The link is also in the description box below. And as always, a huge thank you to the Planet Critical community who make all of this work possible. Thank you all for listening. I'll see you next week.